So take your Bibles, if you would, and open them with me to John chapter 8 this morning. John chapter 8. It's on page 786, 787 in the Black Church Bibles, if you use one of those. Chairs in front of you. As Brother James already shared, today as a nation, we do indeed celebrate our freedom. 245 years ago, on this day in 1776, the then American, 13 American colonies declared themselves to be independent. Signing of the Declaration of Independence, they stated, in essence, we are free states. No longer under the tyranny of Great Britain, as Brother James also made mention, under King George III at that time, they were now independent. But suppose this morning that we had gained our independence from Great Britain, and yet nothing changed. We declared to be free. They consented that we were free. And yet we continued to allow Great Britain to enforce their laws upon us. We allowed Parliament to govern us instead of our own elected officials. Suppose we continue to submit to their demands and their high taxation. What if we declared to be free and nothing changed? Would we be free? Some of the most captive, imprisoned people in our world today think they are free. They claim to be free. They declare to everyone else that they are free. And yet they are bound in shackles and in chains. I'm not referring to national or political freedoms. I'm speaking of a greater freedom, a more important freedom. I'm talking about spiritual freedom. There are multitudes of spiritually imprisoned people today who think they are free. But they have not taken off the shackles, though they've been undone. And they have not left the prison cell, though the door has been unlocked and left wide open for them to go through. All that is required for freedom can, can be completely provided for an imprisoned individual. But until they walk through that prison cell, walk through the door, they are not a free man. They are still living in the liberty, and they are not living in freedom and liberty, but rather they are still under the restraints of their imprisonment. Others can pass by their cell every day and tell, and tell them, hey, you are freed. You don't have to stay here anymore. The door's wide open. Just get up and leave. And you yourself can stay in that prison and say to yourself, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Yet until you walk out of that cell, it does you no good. You are not free, even though freedom has been made available for you. This is what Jesus is going to touch on in this passage this morning. Being made free indeed. Free indeed. Let me just fill everybody in with a little bit of background context as we get into these verses. We'll be reading verses 30 through 36. But at this point, we need to understand that there have been some disputings that have been taking place within a large crowd that had gathered around Jesus there in the city of Jerusalem. They are debating whether or not he is who he has been reported to be whether he is who he seems to be and represents himself to be. And that is the long-awaited Messiah. Those on one side of the debate are claiming, no, 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 no. He's just a prophet. There are others on the other side who are declaring that, no, 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 no. He is the prophet, the one who is foretold in the Old Testament by those prophets. It's he's the one. Some wrestle over how Jesus being a Galilean of Nazareth of all places, how he could be the one when the prophets clearly foretold that the Messiah, the chosen son of David, would come from Bethlehem of Judea. 
And of course, all throughout Jesus' ministry, people struggled with this whole idea that the Messiah would actually enter into the house of sinners and sit at their tables and dine with them. And yet here is Jesus. He's fulfilling prophetic messianic prophecies, showing signs and wonders, miracles that only one who was sent from God could do through the power of God. And so there are these divisions, there are these uh, disputings that are going on in the crowd that is surrounding Jesus. And we pick up this morning at the end of the first part of this discourse that had begun way back in chapter 7, but we pick up in 8 verse 30. I want to read down through verse 36, and this is the entirety of our message right here. Beginning in verse 30, it says this. As he, that is Jesus, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So it's important for us to note that whenever John records here this word Jews in verse 31, these Jews that he's mentioning there, he is not referring to all Jews. He's not referring to every descendant that came through the lineage of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He, he's not talking about those Jews. He's not, he's not targeting an ethnicity. He's targeting a type of people. After all, John himself is a Jew. But he's talking about a certain type of people, a certain type of Jews that were there on that day in that crowd. And the type of person that John is referring to and that Jesus is going to be referring to or speaking to in this instance are those who are in the crowd who believed that they were in good standing with God, that they were A-OK with God because of their religious practices and because of their religious heritage. Those are the Jews that John makes reference here to. All around Jesus were religious leaders, those of the sect of the Pharisees, those of the sect of the Sadducees, and they were mixed in with this large crowd of the crowds that had, that had gathered there within the city for the celebration of the religious festivities surrounding the Feast of Tabernacles. It was these religious leaders who were questioning Jesus in front of everybody. As I indicated earlier, this, this, these verses are only a section of a greater discourse that's taking place, a dialogue between Jesus and this, the religious elite who are around him. And, and it began back in chapter 7. It's got to go all the way to the end of chapter 8 where these religious leaders are going to be picking up stones because they want to stone Jesus to death. So you could say this conversation is going great, isn't it? But this is the context in which we're reading out of. And here in John's record, we see a clear division of two groups of people who are represented. Notice I said we see a clear division, not we clearly see a division. Big difference there, and I'll explain that here in a few minutes. But there are two groups, though they're commonly mistaken as one and the same group. In fact, from the outside looking in, a lot of us would even combine them together as one group. And here they are. Number one, those who believe on Jesus, verse 30, and those who simply believe when it comes to Jesus, verse 31. Those who believe on Jesus, but then there's another group who just believes 
when it comes to things about Jesus. And I'm not trying to be tricky or crafty here or to impress anybody. It's very important that we understand this today. I mean life and death, heaven or hell, important. So let's look at these verses, verse 31, or sorry, verse 30 and verse 31 again. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Huh? Right there. You didn't say it, did you? Of course not, because we have it translated in English. So I'm going to do my best to show you what it looks like in the original language, in the Greek language in which it was recorded. Here's how it appears. Notice on the screen, notice the word on in verse 30. Did you highlight that real quick? Yeah, that's not it. There we go. The word on here is the Greek word ace. E-I-S, ace, Strong's number 1519. So if you were to click on that, it would give you the definition of what that word ace or on means. But then notice in verse 31 there that the word on is combined with the word him. In the English anyway. But ace is not presented there. I know you guys are squinting. It's there, okay? Ace is not presented there in verse 31, the word for on. Instead, on in the English is combined with him. Him is the Strong's word, or the Strong's number 846. It's, it's the same word that stands alone up in verse 30. They're just used in a different tense. You say, but they're spelled differently. Yeah, it's because they're used in a different tense there. But the, they're from the same root word. They have the same Strong's definition. Because they're the same Strong's word. The, the, the root word is a toss. And so there's no dis- difference in the words, just the different tense in which they're, they're used there. It's Strong's 846. If you click on that, you have the same definition for both of them. Same word. I don't think I can beat this horse any longer. It's dead, okay? Same word. But yet in the English, you notice on is shifted over like it's just implied, like it's just, it just is assumed that that's going to go there. We see that they are both preceded by the same word for believed. And I'm not even going to try and say what that Greek word is. Y'all, y'all can read it. But there's no distinction there. Same word for him. Same word for believed. But on, ace, only appears in verse 30, does not appear in verse 31. And the point of all this is, is that in the original language in which this is recorded, verse 30 refers to those who believed on Jesus. Jesus then turns his attention In verse 31, to another group who just believed Jesus. Believed some of the things he was saying. Believed certain things that were about him. By the way, we're going to see later on that these truly did not believe on Jesus because for crying out loud, they're going to want to kill Jesus. So you can tell they don't believe on him as the son of God. But they believe about him. They believe maybe the historical account about him. Maybe they believed some of the miracles that he had done and that he performed. Maybe they saw them themselves, and so they believed it. Maybe they even believed his claim to be the Son of God. Listen, many believe, but they do not believe on Jesus. Let that sit in your mind for just a few moments. Because for someone here today, that may be the difference between heaven and hell. Many believe, but not many believe on. You can believe the biblical facts surrounding Jesus. You can believe all of them. Everything that's recorded there in the text, believe it. He died for the atonement and forgiveness of sins. Yep, I believe that. Check. Believe that he rose from the dead three days later. Check. I believe that. You can believe those things about Jesus, but if you don't believe on Jesus, if you don't put your belief and your trust in him through faith, living, breathing, working, life-transforming, saving faith. If you don't believe on him, then you don't receive the benefits that he has, for what he has done on your behalf. You're still sitting in the jail cell, though he has opened the gate, he's left it open, and you're free to go. He's done it all for you, but you're still in prison because you haven't believed on him. 
You believe about him, you don't believe on him. They're not the same. So memorize all the facts about Jesus you want, but if you don't put your faith and trust on him, you're not saved. It's just the way it is. So Jesus gives us some markers, two of them. He gives us some markers to help identify if one has believed on him and received him as Savior or if they just believe him, believe about him. In verse 31, again, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. First of all, He says, if you continue in his word. In other words, not only do they hear it, not only do they agree and they consent to it, but by believing the truth, they follow it. They obey it. They keep his word. They continue in his word. The King James Version Bible commentary states this. The test of their true faith is given in the conditional clause, if ye continue in my word. They then add, this is not the basis of true faith, but rather the result of it. This is true discipleship. And if you're saying, well, discipleship, is that the same? They didn't have a word for Christian at that time. That doesn't come up till much later. This is a follower of Christ who has believed on him. That's what it's referring to. The phrase continue in my word speaks not only of obedience to all that Jesus says, but also the perseverance of obedience. Did you catch that? It's not just obedience, but the perseverance, the continuance of that obedience. And just to give you a much bigger picture here, some of the other ways that continue is translated in our KJV Bibles here, some of the other ways that it's translated is to abide, remain, dwell, Tarry and endure. That's what it means to continue in his word. And so that's the first marker that shows if one has believed on Jesus and is his disciple. They continue in his word. That leads to the second marker. They will know the truth. And the truth will set them free. In verse 32, do not overlook the very first word. It is very important. And, okay, so this in verse 31, and what he's about to say in verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? So these men who are surrounding him, these Jews, these who have believed about Jesus but haven't believed on him, they take issue with Jesus' assertion that they need to be made free. Now, you've got to understand, behind the idea of being made free is the implication that I'm enslaved. I'm imprisoned. I'm shackled and I'm bound. And I can't free myself. I need somebody else to come along and to free me. They don't like that idea at all. So they buck up against what Jesus says. They don't like this allegation that's coming from Jesus' mouth, implying that they are in spiritual bondage and that they needed liberation. Are you kidding me? Does he know who they are? I, I do not believe, by the way, that when they say that they are in bondage, that they've never been in bondage to anybody, I don't think that they're talking about political and national, uh, physical bondage. I don't believe that's what they're talking about there. Because at that time that they even say these words, they were not free. At the very time that they're saying this, they're under Roman bondage. They're under the Roman oppression. They're under Roman rule. And certainly, they knew their nation's history on top of that. If you say, well, yeah, Roman bondage, they weren't actually in chains, in chains and in prisons. So they really weren't in bondage. Okay, fine. They weren't slaves, but they were still not free. However, they knew their nation's history. In fact, the Feast of Tabernacles was an observance of the day whenever God had liberated them, whenever he had freed them from the Egyptian bondage that they had in the book of Exodus. 
even then, they're celebrating this observance because whenever they exited out of, uh, out of um, uh, Egypt, they went out into the wilderness and throughout those years of wilderness wanderings, they lived in tents or in tabernacles and that's what this feast was to commemorate. It's how God provided for them the water and the manna and the quail, everything that they needed to make it from point A to point B during those wilderness years. And so that's why they had the Feast of the Tabernacles. So they know their nation's history. I don't think they're talking about a political bondage or a national bondage bondage here. They know what they're saying. It's a spiritual bondage. No man's ever restrained us spiritually. We've always been those who worship God. We've always been free. And they picked up on Jesus' use, though, of the word truth. Truth here is absolute truth. Something that is always, in every circumstance, in every era, Without exception, truth. That's the word he uses here. In the day and age in which we live in where this world doesn't like the idea and they say there's no such thing as absolute truth, God in his word disagrees. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says truth will set you free. This truth is universal and it'll set anybody free at any time any place in this world. So let's just review for a second. If they believed on him, they'd continue in his word and they'd know the truth. But these religious leaders, they, they believed that they'd already possessed the truth. You gotta understand this. They believe they already had, you know, they've cornered the market on truth. With what they have made the temple worship into and with all of the new laws that they've added to the Mosaic law. I mean, they thought that they were pretty well. They didn't like the idea that they need to be made free. No, we've got truth here. We're not shackled, spiritually speaking. And so they argue with Jesus' implication that they need to be made free. And, and they argued with him. Can you believe that? As if, by the way, that Jesus... As if that Jesus would make these comments concerning them. Does he not realize that they are of the seed of Abraham? That they are the Jews? That they are born into this world by God's providence? They were select, chosen God's people. They were Abraham's seed. As if that's not enough. And Jesus says they need to be made free. The gall of this man. And so they argue with him. The fact that they're arguing with Jesus and what he says needs to be done is further evidence that these men did not believe on him. Can I just say it right now? If you argue with what the gospel message is and you pick and you choose which ones you want, I just want you to understand you've not believed on Jesus Christ. It is the gospel and nothing else. You do not add to it. You do not take away from it. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. You must believe on that gospel. You must believe on that Christ. It can't be another Christ who you've concocted in your mind and said, well, I like this part. I don't like this part about Jesus. You must believe the gospel, the Christ. Or you have not believed on the Lord. You have not believed on Jesus. So they don't like this idea. The truth of the matter is, they were physical Jews. They were physical Jews, but they were not spiritual Jews. As Paul records in Romans 9, at the end of verse 6, the beginning of verse 7, he says this, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because, they are the, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Great, you're, you're born a Jew, but are you reborn as a child of God? And this is where Jesus is going to go in the following analogy. But I want to stop and just point it out for just a moment. People like this are some of the most hard. That's not good grammar. The most complicated, most difficult people to be able to win to Christ. People like this. They are very religious. They're very moral. And they have a spiritual pedigree. And because they do, they do not see that they need to be saved. They do not see that they need to be made free. 
they automatically assume that they already are. They don't know that they don't know. They can't see that they need to be made free and that they're in bondage to sin. They're a servant of sin. They're shackled to it. They're a slave to it. And they serve it every single day. It's evident that Jesus is not Lord and master of their lives to those around them. It's evident that sin is the Lord and master of their life. They've not been made free. They still serve sin. And so Jesus, not willing to give up on this, he continues on in verse 34 and 35. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Now, when Jesus says, whosoever committeth sin, we need to understand he's not referring to everyone who has sinned or everyone who does sin. The word sin here is used in the present tense. Present tense Greek, meaning that this is referring to habitual, continual, reoccurring, accepted, unrepented sinning. That's what it's talking about. It's a pattern of sinning. It's a lifestyle of sin. These are the type of people that Jesus is referring to when he says, whosoever committeth sin. Those people are servants of sin. It is their master. Over in Romans chapter 6, Paul writes in verses 16 through 18, very similarly, he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey? whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. No, let's pause there for just a second. All of us right here, all of us are serving one of two masters. Every single one of us here. One is unto death. The other is unto righteousness. And Paul explains it frankly, bluntly. He says that you know who your master is based off of which one you obey. Which one you submit to? He goes on to verse 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, it was delivered you. So he's talking to these Christians in this Roman letter. He said, oh, but you've been delivered from that. Now verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Again, there's only two choices of who you serve. And the phrase being made free from sin doesn't mean that you no longer sin if you're freed from sin. That's not what it means. However, when you are made free from sin, when this does happen, you won't sin like you once did. You won't sin in the same way as you did when you were in bondage to it. There's a change in the pattern to sin. You're not sinless but you will sin less. That's what this is referring to. There is a change in the pattern of sin. You'll occasionally fall. You'll occasionally stumble. You'll get dirty, but Christ will always be there to pick you up, to dust you off, and to get you back going. You won't remain in that sin. You won't embrace sin as if it's something acceptable that you can have within your life. Because you don't serve sin anymore. You've got a new master. You've got a good master. And sin just doesn't taste like it used to. You got a new appetite. Over in 1 John 3. He explains it this way in verses 6 through 9. Whosoever abideth in him. Referring to Jesus. Whosoever abideth in him. Sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Again, understand what we just discussed. This is the same use of the word. It's in the present tense. It's that embracing. It's that continual, habitual uh, acceptance of sin in your life. A sinful lifestyle, whatever. But it's not just because you have sinned. It's that continual acceptance of sin. Verse 7. 
Little children, let no man deceive you. I'd love that John included that. I love it. If you've turned there, you ought to have this highlighted in your Bible, underscored, circled, arrows pointing to it. Let no man deceive you. If someone comes along and they tell you, oh no, you can be saved and continue in sin just as you were before. You're still saved. Lie. Let no man deceive you. Why would he write that? Because he knew there would be masses of churches that say, oh, it's okay. You're all right in God's eyes. You said a prayer, right? You're good. You're going to heaven. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is, right, is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, woe, is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now catch this, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit Sin, habitual, embracing, acceptance. You know it's sin, but you say, it's okay. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. It's like trying to undo your DNA. You can't. You're born into the family of God. You got the DNA, DNA of God. You can't take it apart and make it something else. It remains in you. So let's go back to John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. And the analogy that Jesus uses here is pretty clear. A servant does not remain in the master's house forever but a son abides forever he's there forever slaves and sons they can appear side by side being in the same room at the same time but at the end of the day they don't stay there for the same extent of time a slave can be removed replaced disqualified from his position of service within the household and oftentimes servants were only there to serve for a, a certain period of time and when that time was up or whenever their contract was fulfilled, or whenever the debt was fully paid and they had to move on to the next master that they owed, they moved to this other household. But they were not in the household forever. But the point here is the position of a servant is temporary in the household. The position of a son is permanent. He's always there. A servant can commit an offense and be removed from the house forever, banished, kicked out. A son can commit the same offense, even a greater offense. And though he will be chastened, he's forgiven. He's accepted. He remains. Because a son is a son forever. I don't believe that it's mere coincidence that the word abideth used here in verse 35 is this. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's the exact same word that Jesus used up in verse 31. It's the Greek word meno. They're the same word. And yet in verse 31, it's translated as continue. So we put these together, what Jesus is saying. Those who continue in his word, it is a mark that they have believed on Jesus. And those who abide in the house forever, it is a sign that they are a son and not a mere servant. Therefore, we understand, we can put those two together. Those who are sons are those who continue in his word. The message of Jesus to these religious leaders is loud and clear when you unpack it. He's saying to them, you are slaves. You need to be made sons. You are servants to sin. But God wants to change your status to be sons of God. They, being Jews, may have been of Abraham's physical seed by birth, but they were not of his spiritual seed by rebirth, or as Jesus put it, born again in John chapter 3. 
Jesus is the promised seed, which was foretold all the way back in Genesis 3, there in the Garden of Eden. And then later on, God makes a covenant in Genesis 12 with Abraham. And he says that the seed is going to come through his lineage. And then again, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God chooses another man, makes a covenant with him by the name of David. And he says, oh, you, oh by the way, David's of the lineage of Abraham. He says, now it's going to come through your lineage as well. And there will always be a man who will sit upon the throne of David. And then roughly about 970 years or so later, after he makes that covenant to David, Jesus came into the world through the Davidic lineage, just as it was prophesied. And God himself spoke from heaven and said, he is the only begotten son of God. The divine seed, having been placed within the womb of a virgin and born in Bethlehem, he was there, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, son of God, son of man. He's the one standing before those religious, pious gas bags and saying, hey, listen, if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And they missed it. They couldn't see it past their own sin and their own pride, in which they were servants to. But Christ himself was there and he says, I'm here to set you free. Believe all you want that I've said, but you must believe on me if you're going to be free indeed. And they miss it. Jesus replaces the truth shall make you free from verse 32 with the son shall make you free in verse 36. You want to know why? Because Jesus is truth. He is that truth. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes through the Father but by me. He is the truth. Only Jesus has the authority. Only Jesus has the power. Only Jesus has accomplished what it takes to take a person and change their status from a servant to a son. Only Jesus can do that for us. He alone gives spiritual freedom. Freedom from sin. He alone can make us free indeed. Set free from the power of sin in this present life. Yeah, I said in this present life, set free from the power of sin. It no longer governs you. It no longer rules over you. It no longer lords over you. Set free from the judgment of sin, from the eternal condemnation of sin in the coming life. And oh, praise God, set free from the presence of sin in God's heavenly kingdom one day. Think about that for just a moment. Set free from the presence of sin. No more sin means no more curse, according to Revelation 21 and chapter 22 also. No more sin means no more curse. That means no more death. No more diseases, cancers, Alzheimer's, bodily infections, organs that fell and need to be transplanted, replaced. Hearts that give out. No more death. No more sin. Means no more suffering. No one will be harmed. No one will be homeless. No one will be orphaned. No one will be hungry. No one will be without. No one will be lonely. No one will be abandoned. No one will be forgotten. No more sin means there will be no more sorrow. No more sorrow, no more crying. No broken homes. No broken hearts. No broken marriages. No broken friendships. No broken relationships. No more sin means no more pain. Not physical pain. Not emotional pain. Talk about being made free. But that's in the next life. That's in the next life when we are free from the presence of sin. Right now, Jesus desires to free from the power of sin. Right now, in this life, Jesus desires to free from the power of sin. The only way a person could be freed from that damnable disposition of being a slave to sin, a servant of Satan, Sentenced to an eternal suffering. The only way for that to happen is that Christ save them. That he convert them. That he transform them. From a sinner to a saint. From a slave to a son. That's what it, 
That's what it's going to take. And that's what takes place when a person believes on Jesus. On this day, we celebrate our national freedom and liberty. But I wonder, can you honestly celebrate this freedom that Jesus is speaking of here? Have you been set free from the bondage of sin? Have you been made free from the power of sin? Have you believed on Jesus or have you just believed about Jesus? As they say, the proof is in the pudding. Who do you serve? If you're a born-again believer today, then listen, we should certainly celebrate. Celebrate not just today, but every day because Christ has made us free. No longer a slave to sin under the bondage, under the control, under uh, having to obey sin in our lives. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be made free indeed. So we ought to give thanks. And we ought to celebrate today and every day but we also ought to walk with wisdom. Walk with this wisdom, wisdom to recognize that there are some who are in your circles. There are some in your household, maybe. Maybe even some who are in this church who they have not been made free. They've believed about Jesus, but they haven't believed on Jesus. They do not know that they do not know. But the signs are all there. They do not continue in his word. They remain in bondage to sin in their lives. They haven't been made free. They turn over a new leaf, but there's no lasting change. There's no transformation. There's no rebirth. Someone has to lovingly tell them. They need to know that they're still sitting in a prison cell and they're not free. They've probably already heard this many times that Jesus has unlocked that door for them. He's left the gate wide open. But they need to step out of that cell and follow Jesus. And when they do, they'll have no desire to go, with that, go back to that cell. They'll have no desire to remain in that prison. They'll have a new nature with new desires to live a new life, free, out from under sin's control. And when sin does come into their life, they'll despise it. When they do commit it, they'll make it right. They'll go back for forgiveness. But they will not tolerate, embrace, accept sinful lifestyles. They've been made free. Somebody's got to tell him. I began with this question. What if we declared to be free, but nothing changed? Are we free?